All right. Stand with me if you would. I want to read the uh, two brief passages that you'll see later on, I think, uh, are the keys uh, to Proverbs. Proverbs 1, 5 to 7, and then uh, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Let the wise hear and increase in learning, and the one who understands obtain guidance to understand a proverb and a saying, the words of the wise and their riddles. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. In Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. This is what it's the inerrant, infallible, all sufficient word of God. May the Lord teach us through it tonight. Enhance and increase biblical wisdom so that we can live uh, godly lives in a wicked and perverse generation as the, as the shades are falling quickly upon us. Thank you. Please be seated. I would remind you, can you put up that next slide, Michelle? I think it's the, did, we not, did I not leave the, the theme, the overarching, that would remind you of what, what's driving this study or should be driving this study if I'm doing my job. And that's John 5, 39 and 40, where Jesus confronted the religious leaders and he said to them, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. Now he's not chiding them for doing that. And it is they, the scriptures, that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. It's, it's a clear indication of a mishandling of the scriptures. Anyone who, who comes sincerely with a teachable spirit to the Word of God will find Jesus Christ. They testify of Him in such a way that we should be compelled to come to Him. I told you, I've told you this before, I won't go into the whole story or the whole quote. Madeleine Murray O'Hare, the head of the American Atheist League, said in a forum that, that we had at our university when I was going to school there, she debated a, a professor of ethics at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary where I was, I was headed at the time. It wasn't really a debate, it was like a verbal boxing match. He couldn't, he couldn't complete a sentence, it was awful. But she said during that time, she said, I, I read through the Bible one weekend and then said some awful things about God. Well, she didn't come to the scriptures with a view to learning. She didn't come to submit herself to them. But anyone who does will find wisdom and they'll find wisdom in Jesus Christ. Uh, Proverbs is, is probably the most practical book in the Old Testament. It teaches wisdom. And, and some definitions of wisdom have been offered. One of, the, one of the ones I like is skillful living. Uh, you could say applied, knowledge rightly applied. And it does this, it addresses this in, in multiple aspects of everyday life. There are these short, pithy sayings. There's maxims stories, and in these, Solomon and some other contributors you're going to see tonight uh, put together about 900 proverbs. They are these inspired precepts that, that deal with, with wisdom and folly. You'll see this contrast, pride and humility, justice and vengeance laziness and work, poverty and wealth, friends and neighbors, love and lust, anger and strife, masters and servants, and life and death. Someone has observed that when you read Proverbs, you're not reading theory. You're reading that which is, is practical. Many of them are easily memorized. In fact, we could probably go around tonight and you could share with us 
proverbs that you've memorized through the years that, that stick with you. They're, they're timeless truths, and they touch on every facet of human relationships. One fellow said this, I like he said, reading a proverb takes only a few seconds. Applying a proverb can take a lifetime. I'm going to ask Michelle now if she would to show us, uh, cue up the uh, Bible Project video of the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs. The word proverb typically refers to a short, clever saying that offers some kind of wisdom, and this book has a lot of those. But they're almost all in the center section of the book, chapters 10 to 29. But there is way more going on in the book of Proverbs, especially at the beginning, chapters 1 through 9, and the conclusion, chapters 30 and 31. The book's been designed with an introduction, chapter 1, verses 1 through 9, and it first of all links this book to King Solomon. Now remember the story in 1 Kings chapter 3. Solomon had asked God for wisdom to lead Israel well. And so Solomon became known as the wisest man in the ancient world. And we're told in 1 Kings chapter 4 that he wrote thousands of proverbs and poems and collected knowledge about plants and animals. So Solomon was like the fountainhead of Israel's wisdom literature. So while not all the material in this book is written by him personally, he is where Israel's wisdom tradition began. The introduction says that by reading this book, you too can gain wisdom. Now wisdom for most of us means knowledge, but the Hebrew word chokhmah means much more than just mental activity. It refers to action also. So think skill or applied knowledge. This is why back in the book of Exodus, chapter 31, it was artists and craftsmen in Israel who were said to have chokhmah. So the purpose of this book is to help you develop a set of practical skills for living well in God's world. And this gets linked with another key idea in the introduction, the fear of the Lord. Now fear here is not about terror. It's about a healthy sense of reverence and awe for God and about my place in the universe. It's a moral mindset that recognizes I am not God and that I don't get to make up my own definitions of good and evil and right and wrong. Rather, I need to humble myself before God and embrace God's definition of right and wrong even when that's inconvenient for me. Now this introduction leads us into the first main section of the book, chapters 1 through 9, which also doesn't contain short one-liner proverbs. Rather, what we find here are 10 speeches from a father to a son about how the son should listen to wisdom and cultivate the fear of the Lord and live accordingly, which means a life of virtue and integrity and generosity, all of which lead to success and peace. And the father warns his son also about folly and evil evil and stupid decisions that will breed selfishness and pride, all leading to ruin and shame. And so the son should make the pursuit of wisdom and the fear of the Lord his highest goal in life. And this way of thinking, it forms the moral logic of this entire book. Now these speeches from the father also clue us into what biblical wisdom literature is and how it's different from other parts of the Bible. These books explore how to live well in God's world, but wisdom is not the same as law, like what Moses gave Israel at Mount Sinai. And it's not the same as prophecy, divine speech to God's people. Rather, wisdom literature has the accumulated insight of God's people through the generations about how to live in a way that honors God and others. And so, through the book of Proverbs now, these human words about wisdom have been put together as God's word and wisdom to his people. Which connects to the other thing you find in chapters 1 through 9. There are four poems from Lady Wisdom. Here, wisdom has been poetically personified as a woman who calls out to humanity to pay attention and to seek her. Wisdom says that she is woven into the fabric of the universe. And so wherever you see people make making wise decisions, they are relying on her. So you see someone being generous or having sexual integrity or upholding justice. They are drawing on wisdom. These Lady Wisdom poems, they're a creative, poetic way of exploring this idea that we live in God's moral universe and that goodness and justice are objective realities that we ignore to our own peril. And so fearing the Lord, living wisely, it's living along the grain of the universe. 
Now, together, these two sets of speeches from the Father and Lady Wisdom, they make a powerful claim about this book, that you're not simply reading good advice. You're reading God's own invitation to learn wisdom from previous generations. And so in the next section of the book, chapters 10 through 29, we find hundreds of ancient proverbs, and they apply wisdom and the fear of the Lord to every life topic you could imagine. Family, work, neighborhood, friendship, sex, marriage, money, anger, forgiveness, alcohol, debt, everything. And these are all filtered through the value system of Proverbs 1 through 9. Now these Proverbs, they're all pretty short. They're easy to memorize. And actually this section of the book is meant to become a reference work that you return to time and time again throughout the years, which raises some important issues in learning how to read these Proverbs. First of all, Proverbs are by nature about probabilities. So you fear the Lord and you make wise, good choices things will likely go well for you. And if you don't fear the Lord, you're foolish, your life will likely not go so well. Now, that is all often true, but not always. Which leads to the next point, that Proverbs are not promises. They're not formulas for success. So, some Proverbs, for example. The fear of the Lord prolongs your life, but the years of the wicked are cut short. Or, train up a child in the way they should go, and when they're old, they won't turn from it. So yes, fearing God, being a moral person, will most likely lead to a better, longer life. And raising your kids in a stable, loving home does set them up well. But there are no guarantees. Lots of things can and often do go wrong in our world. And so lastly, Proverbs by nature focus on the general rule, but not the exceptions, which are many. And the wisdom books actually aren't ignorant of that. The exceptions are what the other wisdom books, Job and Ecclesiastes, are all about. And together, these acknowledge that life is too complex for simple formulas, which is why we need all of the wisdom books together to get the bigger picture. This all leads to the final section of the book, two large collections of poems. First, poems from a man named Agur, who begins by acknowledging his own ignorance and folly and his great need for God's wisdom. And then Agur discovers that divine wisdom has been given to him in the scriptures, which teach him how to live well. And so Agur is put before us as like a model reader of the book of Proverbs, somebody who's always open to hearing God's wisdom through the scriptures. The final poems are connected to a man named Lemuel. He's a non-Israelite king, and he passes on the wisdom that was given to him by his mom. It's guidance for being a wise and just leader. And then the final poem is an acrostic or an alphabet poem where each line begins with a new letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And the entire poem's about the woman of noble character. It depicts a woman who lives according to the wisdom of Proverbs and stands like a model of someone who takes God's wisdom and then translates it into practical decisions in everyday life, at work or at home, in her family and in her community. So the book opened with words from a father to a son about listening to Lady Wisdom. And so now the book closes by offering the words of a mother to her son about a woman who lives wisely. The book of Proverbs is for every person in every season of life. It's a guide for living wisely and well in God's good world. And that's what the book of Proverbs is all about. All right. I hope you picked up, uh, it speaks of probabilities, not promises. I think that's important to, to recognize. I think a lot of folks have been shipwrecked by not understanding that. I've, I've known uh, not a few parents through the years uh, who if a child goes astray as they hit teen years or even adulthood, and they look and say, well, I don't understand. I've, I raised up the child, my child in the way that he or she should go, and now they're gone a different way. Uh, and, they, and they want to claim that as a promise. It speaks of probabilities, but not absolutely. There are exceptions. So let's do a survey of Proverbs. Uh, it teaches this, what I said, skillful living. Somebody has, uh, the, the Hebrew word for proverb is mashal. 
It means comparison, uh, something similar to or parallel. Uh, and it uses a lot of, these use a lot of that in, in the expression of the Proverbs. It's been defined, the proverb has been defined as a simple illustration that exposes a fundamental reality about life. Um, the, you heard him use the word chokmah. Uh, that is the Hebrew word for, for wisdom. Uh, and he, I agree with the, exactly with the way he, de, he defined that in terms of applied uh, skill, action, not theory. And so, so chokmah is not, uh, it's not just about what you know. It's about what you do with what you know. Um, wisdom is more than uh, shrewdness or intelligence. Uh, it really takes up a, a practical righteousness uh, and a moral uh, understanding and awareness. And when you look at the book of Proverbs, you can divide it into six segments. There's, uh, the purpose is given in chapter 1, verses 1 to 7. Uh, we'll look at that a little later. Uh, secondly, the, the Proverbs to the youth, uh, chapter 1, verse 8 to 9, 18. The Proverbs of Solomon, uh, chapter 10, 1 to 24, 34. Uh, then the Proverbs of Solomon that were copied by uh, Hezekiah's men. We're going we're to look at these things. The words of Agur, uh, which he referenced in chapter 30, and then the words of King Lemuel in chapter 31. I don't, how many of you knew that the, the, one of the passages we love to read on, on the, the godly woman of Proverbs 31, that that's, that's a figure of speech just like Psalm 119 is. Every line in it begins with uh, the corresponding sequential uh, letter of the Hebrew al alphabet. Did you, were you, did you come across that before? Okay. It's, I think it's just it's one of those places in the Old Testament that's a fascinating literary device. It's designed so that it makes it easier to memorize. Doesn't help us because we don't read Hebrew, but if we, were, if we read Hebrew, we would see the value of it, the beauty of it. Um, so let's look, the, the, the purpose of Proverbs. Is that me? Is that me dinging? Okay. Well, repent, sister. Right. How often did you get to call on your wife to repent from the pulpit? The bigger question was, how often should you do something like that when you have to go home later? But that's, uh, <laughs> that's a whole different discussion. I heard that a while ago, and I, won't, I don't want to digress, because she and I have the same apps on our phone. And I, and I recognized that thing, and I thought, is that, is that my phone? I pulled it out and looked at it. No, it's not. So mystery solved. All right. Uh, the purpose of Proverbs, uh, it, in, that, in this early verses, it, it states the author, the theme, and the purpose of the book. We'll look at that when we get to theme and purpose. The, the section, the Proverbs to the youth, uh, after the introduction, uh, there's a series of 10 exhortations, each one beginning with my son. So as you, as you read through uh, chapter one, verse eight, through uh, chapter nine, 18, you'll be able to mark these, these uh, sections, when each one, my son, and then it gives us the teaching there. They introduce the concept of wisdom in this section. Uh, in the format of a father's efforts to persuade his son to pursue the path of wisdom in order to achieve godly success in life. Now, obviously, the same thing could be said to a daughter. It's, uh, it's, it's parental instruction to a child. And I would say that, that a parent who's not keenly aware of the content of this section of Proverbs is, is uh, not absolutely, but probably flying by the seat of your pants in terms of instructing uh, children. When you read through this, uh, chapters uh, one to four, wisdom rejects the invitation uh, to participate in crime uh, and foolishness. Uh, wisdom rewards seekers of wisdom on every level. And wisdom's discipline provides freedom and safety. The, this is one of the, it's, it's very much like the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments look very restrictive, but, but if you're traveling through life and you know that there are many precipices in life that you can easily go off the edge of, then the, the, the moral law of God, much like this wisdom literature, forms rails for you which help you to travel safely uh, with good uh, freedom. Uh, in this section, wisdom protects uh, a person from illicit sensuality and the consequences of it, uh, from foolish practices, from laziness, from outright adultery, and the lure of the harlot. 
And remember now, because this, even though it says my son, the implication is to, this to be true to a daughter. So the harlot can be, the, can be a, a sinful woman or a sinful man luring you, uh, luring someone into uh, ungodly living. Wisdom is to be preferred to folly because it's, it's divine origin uh, and it's rich benefits. And you see the contrast. If you know Proverbs, you know, you see a person who does this, uh, there's more hope for him than for a fool. And you think, I mean, the fool is marked out over and over again in Proverbs. So if there's, if there's uh, what's going on here? So the contrast is there. And then when you read through this section, you see that there, there are four kinds of fools that, are, that crop up. They're all the way from uh, someone who's naive, just, uh, just not informed, not, uh, hasn't hadn't fed on truth. Uh, someone who's, who's not committed, all the way to scoffers, uh, those who arrogantly despise the way of the Lord. And then I found this, which I thought was a good note, says the fool in Proverbs is not mentally deficient. Think about that, because Jesus, Jesus rebukes his hearers in the Gospels when you speak of another individual as a fool. And that's not what this word's about. It's not a person who's mentally deficient. His problem is he's self-sufficient. He orders his life as if there were no God. The fool is said in his heart, there is no God. And then when you get this next, next section, there's the Proverbs of Solomon, chapters 10, 1 to chapter 24, 34. Uh, not a lot of topical arrangement here. Uh, you, you find what one writer I read calls thematic clusters, uh, chapter 26, 1 to 12. Uh, anyway, but typically the units in this section are one verse maxims. Uh, and you can, you can order them, you can go through, and people have done this. Uh, where you can say, okay, here's what he says about uh, speech. Here's what he says about money. If you, if you have access to one of, those, one of those books or digital files, it's, it's a very handy thing to see, you know, Solomon on in this, this topic. And they've gone through and harvested uh, the, the themes. This particular collection of Solomon's Proverbs is th 375 Proverbs here. Then you get to chapters 10 to 15, the contrasts uh, uh, right and wrong in practice. And I thought this was interesting that all but 19 of the Proverbs in chapters 10 to 15 use antithetical parallelism. Not this, but this. This may, may be the case, but that's, that's not good. This is better. So this, this contrast is antithetical contrast. Parallels that compare uh, opposite principles. Then chapter 16 through uh, 22, verse 16, offers a series of self-evident moral truths. In this section, all but 18 Proverbs use synonymous parallelism. I've talked to you about before about this Hebrew uh, tool where you say something and then say it again a different way, and, it, and it's driving home the point. Same thing, different way. Uh, there's a section, the words of the wise men, chapters 22 to uh, 17 to, to 24, 34. Uh, when you look at those, it's in two groups. And the first group includes 30 distinct sayings. And then the second group, there's six more uh, distinct sayings found in that. So that's the next section in the, in the book we mentioned is chapters 25, 1 to 29, 27. These are the Proverbs of Solomon copied by Hezekiah's men. Uh, look at Proverbs 25.1. It actually introduces the section this way. These also are Proverbs of Solomon, which the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah, copied. And you have a lot of uh, thematic overlap of these Proverbs and what, what we have, what we call Solomon's uh, Proverbs that he delivered directly. And then by the time you get through, through that, you come to the, these words of Agur, uh, chapter 30. Uh, we don't know a whole lot about Agur and, and, and not a whole lot about Lemuel. The, the uh, fellow on the video identified him as a, as a non-Jewish king uh, whose mother uh, gave him good instruction. But we just don't know. 
And then, of course, chapter 31. This is probably, the, if you're talking about a chapter in Proverbs, this is probably the chapter most people are most familiar with. Uh, it, it's that acrostic, 22 verses, and, uh, and they're starting off with, with the corresponding alphabet, uh, Gimel Daleth, of the Hebrew alphabet. It portrays this virtuous wife. And we'll take a little more look at, at that when we get into the uh, seeing Jesus. Now, the key word is, is wisdom. Uh, the ability to live life skillfully is one, another definition to come across. It's, Proverbs is, is a good guide for how to live a godly life in an ungodly world. And I would say if ever we needed the book of Proverbs, we need it today. Because we're living in a day where the moral absolutes are gone. I want you to think about something for a minute. I'm soon to be 65. I'm not pretending that when I grew up as a child that it was a, it was a, a moral day. There was immorality. But there were some givens when I grew up. The given, one of the givens was that, that sexual sin was wrong. One of the givens was that, that a, you, could, you could identify a baby at birth as a boy or a girl. Another given was that you should that God's ideal for marital relationships is one man, one woman joined in a one flesh relationship for life. Another one was that, that life was sacred. Abortions were going on, but they were going on in, in, in back alleys. And brothers and sisters, all of that is gone. It has been completely obliterated. I don't want to be uh, indiscreet here. But Planned Parenthood's site, you can go check this out for yourself, has now, they have a section there where they, where they introduce children to, uh, to sexuality, to their own sexuality. And you can go back, and then it's, it's copied from years ago, uh, not that many years ago, where they would talk about how a, how a little child could know and, and be comfortable in his own skin if he was a little boy and talk about that and his biology and a little girl. On that same site now, it's... Your biology does not determine your sex. We need to be anchored and aware and saturated with, as do our children, in, in moral absolutes. And the book of Proverbs is a great a place to start. It provides God's detailed instructions for his people to deal successfully with practical affairs of everyday life. How to relate to God, how to, how to relate to your parents, uh, children, neighbors, government. Do you realize that some of the instructions in Proverbs on the corporal discipline of a child would be considered crimes today? Beat your child off and it will not kill him. And you understand the context of that. Solomon uses, as I said earlier, poetry, parables, pithy questions, short stories, wise maxims. And he gives them in a form uh, that is so, so much common sense there with a divine perspective. And so he's considered the author, even though we recognize that there are other contributors. Because as the video said, and I agree with this, he is the pinnacle of Israel's era of wisdom. The Hebrew title of the book, by the way, uh, is Mishe Shalema, uh, the Proverbs of Solomon. The Greek title is uh, Peromiae Salomontos, the Proverbs of Solomon. The Latin title is the Liber Prover Prover Proverbiorum, the book of Proverbs. The rabbinical writings, I thought this was interesting, called the Proverbs the Sefer Chokmah, the book of wisdom.
Look at 1 Kings 4.32. As I said, we have 900 Proverbs in, in the book, and I think about 800 of them are attributed to uh, Solomon. 1 Kings 4.32 says, He, speaking of Solomon, also spoke 3,000 Proverbs, and his songs were 1,005. Only about 800 of those are included in this particular book. You remember in 1 Kings 3, 5 to 9, he asked God for wisdom. Look at that with me if you would. 1 Kings 3, 5 to 9. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I shall give you. Solomon said, You have shown great and steadfast love to your servant David, my father, because he walked before you in faithfulness, in righteousness, and uprightness of heart towards you. And you've kept for him this great and steadfast love and have given him a son to sit on his throne this day. And now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of David, my father. Although I am but a little child, I do not know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of your people whom you've chosen, a great people, too many to be numbered or counted for multitude. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to govern this, your great people? And God, you remember, granted this to him. Look at 1 Kings 4, 29 to 31. And God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding beyond measure and breadth of mind like the sand of the seashore. Think about that. When you read that, I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm thinking, wow. We're talking, about, we're talking about someone approaching Adam's understanding. Not completely, because Solomon has fallen. So that Solomon's wisdom surpassed the wisdom of all the people of the east and all the wisdom of Egypt. For he was wiser than all other men, wiser than Ethan, the Ezraite, and Himan, Kalko, and Darda, the sons of Mahal. And his fame was in all the surrounding nations. And because of this, we read, uh, like in 1 Kings 4.34, just a couple of verses down, uh, that People from foreign lands came to hear him speak. Look, and people of all nations came to hear the wisdom of Solomon and from all the kings of the earth who had heard of his wisdom. 1 Kings 10.1 talks about the, the Queen of Sheba. Now when the Queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, she came to test him with hard questions. In the same chapter, verse 24. And the whole earth sought the presence of Solomon to hear his wisdom which God had put into his mind. He had extraordinary uh, knowledge, aptitude, skill, perception. And, and when he was at his, at his zenith, you know, he had some difficulties toward the end of his life, but at his zenith, uh, prosperity that came to Israel, the glory that came to Israel was phenomenal. Now, one writer observed that he, Solomon probably collected and edited Proverbs other than his own. If you look at Ecclesiastes 12, 9, this, is a, this gives us a hint of this. It said, besides being wise, the preacher, and by the way, the preacher, we're going to see this when we get to, to Ecclesiastes, uh, Solomon, also taught the people knowledge, weighing and studying the arranging many Proverbs with great care. So he's, he was harvesting there was, there was a whole wisdom culture in his day. Um, I told you the second collection was assembled by the, by the scribes of King Hezekiah. Because Hezekiah, when you go back and read, had an interest in, in, in spiritually benefiting the people that he served as king. You remember, or you may not remember, that when Hezekiah was king, that, that Micah uh, and Isaiah ministered uh, during Hezekiah's reign. Uh, and some have suggested that perhaps the two prophets were also involved uh, in this collection. Look at Proverbs 22, 17 with me and, and 24, 23. You, and you get this, this idea of these collected Proverbs. Incline your ear and hear the words of the wise, this idea of the words of the wise, and apply your heart to my knowledge. And then again, chapter 24, verse 23. These also are sayings of the wise, this idea of the sayings of the wise. Partiality and judging is not good. And 
Uh, one of the writers I was looking at said that, that these kind, this kind of language is similar to, to this, and I'm going to try to pronounce this name, the wisdom of uh, Amenemope, who was, a, who was an Egyptian uh, wise man. It's a document of teachings on civil service by an Egyptian who lived between 1000 BC and 600 BC and the date of the writings of, of, of Proverbs on, on Solomon's part was, would have been uh, 931 BC. One of the accounts I read said that wise men of this period of time went to hear one another. They would, they would listen and glean from one another. And some suggest that this Egyptian came and heard uh, Solomon and borrowed from, from some of the language, this, this idea of the, of the wise men. As I said, we don't have information biblically about Agur or, uh, uh, or Lemuel. When you go through and look at the uh, biblical information we have, when you think about the date and the settings, uh, look at Jeremiah 18, 18, and then Ezekiel, we'll look at that, 7, 26. There are three groups, this is important, three groups of uh, people who made an impact on their culture. There were the priests who imparted the law, the prophets who communicated the divine word and visions, thus saith the Lord, and the sages or the, or the elders, they gave counsel to the people. This, this would be the section of the, of the wisdom material practical application of godly wisdom to specific problems and decisions. Look at these two verses. Jeremiah 18, 18. Then they said, come, let us make plots against Jeremiah, for the law shall not perish from the priest, nor counsel from the wise, nor the word from the prophet. See those divisions there? Come, let us strike him with the tongue, and let us not pay attention to any of his words. And in Ezekiel, the prophet Ezekiel 7, 26, disaster comes upon disaster. Rumor follows rumor. They seek a vision from the prophet while the law perishes from the priest and counsel from the elders. So there's this, clearly this, this threefold, uh, we've studied uh, the law in the historical books on Sunday nights here. We'll be heading into the prophets. And so in the middle of that is this, this wisdom literature. When we look at Ecclesiastes 1.1, 1, 1, uh, we see here this, this preacher is a good example of the wisdom school. The words of the preacher, son of David, king in Jerusalem. Uh, Ecclesiastes 1.12, I the preacher have been king over Israel uh, in Jerusalem. Ecclesiastes 7.27, behold, this is what I found, says the preacher, while adding one thing to another to find the scheme of things. And then of course the passage we're most familiar with in, in uh, perhaps in Ecclesiastes 12, 8 and 10. Vanity of vanity, says the preacher, all is vanity. Besides being wise, the preacher also taught the people knowledge, weighing and studying and arranging many proverbs with great care. The preacher sought to find words of delight and uprightly he wrote words of truth. This, this word that shows up in the Hebrew for preacher um, is one who addresses an assembly. He presided over uh, an academy of wise men and taught the people knowledge, as we just read. Um, so we're going we're gonna to peg the date generally from what we know of the, around 931 B.C. Uh, someone suggested that this, this group of uh, Proverbs put together by the, the men of, of Hezekiah uh, would have been collected about 230 years later, so about seven 15 to 686 B.C., just before destruction. Now, what about the theme and the purpose? Well, Proverbs is one of the few books in the Bible that lays out its theme. It spells it out uh, intentionally. The purpose statement is in chapter 1, verses 2 to 6. Let's look at that together. Well, here's the Proverbs. To know wisdom and instruction to understand words of insight, to receive instruction in wise dealing, in righteousness, justice, and equity, to give prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the youth. Let the wise hear and increase in learning, and the one who understands obtain guidance. 
to understand a proverb and a saying, the words of the wise and their riddles, their, their perplexing considerations. So you have this, this idea here, the purpose to impart moral discernment and discretion, to know what's right and wrong and, and then how to apply that in living, how to live in the light of what is right, how to live and avoid what is wrong, and then to develop mental clarity and perception. These words of wisdom and instruction here are a complement. Wisdom, we've told you, is the word chokmah. It means this the skill. Uh, instruction is a word that means discipline. One writer said this, I thought this was, said, no skill is perfected without discipline. And when a person has skill, he has freedom to create something beautiful. You, you recognize that? If you, if you don't have the developed skills, we just watched uh, Clifton come through boot camp. I don't really have any problem knowing that he's packing an M16 or whatever, whatever rifle they carry these days. He's been thoroughly trained in it. But I would be concerned <laughs> about somebody that was not skilled in handling a weapon. There's got to be skill, but there's got to be discipline as well. It's got to be to know uh, how to apply. Someone has said, I, I read this years ago, that, that to master something, you need to give 10,000 hours to it. And in doing that, then you, you, can, you can say that you've mastered it. I don't know that that's absolutely true, but I do know this, that if you will take the Word of God, meditate upon it, feed upon it, hide it in your heart, pray to God for, for discernment, to apply. I don't know how many hours that takes, but a person can become skilled in godly living. I think what happens in our day is too often it just it's, it becomes knowledge absorbed. Uh, and the scripture warns about that, that a little knowledge can puff up. But when someone, someone comes to the scripture, particularly the book of Proverbs, says, I want to know this, I want to memorize this, because I want this to shape my life. And then that can be very valuable, this idea of, 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 of wisdom and instruction. And when you, are, when you have that combination, there's a great liberty that comes there. And so Proverbs, when you take that combination, deals with the most fundamental skill of all, practical righteousness in the sight of God in every area of life. And this requires uh, knowledge, experience, and a willingness to put God first. And that's, that's our Proverbs 3, 5 to 7. In these early chapters of Proverbs, we looked at a while ago, uh, as, as the author of the video suggested, they sort of introduced the whole matter. And then there's a reflection back to them in the, in the various parts of the books, designed uh, both to prevent and to remedy ungodly lifestyles. The book historically, uh, in the life of, of the Old Testament saints, uh, served, uh, it was a manual, it, it gave a legacy of wisdom and prudence and understanding and discretion and knowledge and guidance and competence, correction, counsel. It was the idea of passing truth on from generation to generation. And we live in a day that shows what happens when that's lost. The theme of Proverbs is the fear of the Lord is the beginning of uh, knowledge. We, Proverbs 1, 7. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. So there's your, there's your contrast. The fear of the Lord. But a fool despises it. How do you know whether you're dealing with a fool? How do you know if you're being foolish? And the, the biblical answer is it's how you respond to God's truth, God's revealed truth. A person that reads it, sees it, hears it, is admonished by it and says, it's none of your business like we talked about this morning. 
You're dealing with a fool. And a fool that continues his or her foolishness unabated is destroyed by his or her own hand. To fear God is to stand in awe of his righteousness, of his majesty, of his power. So stand in awe. The scripture says, stand in awe and sin not. Commune with your own heart and be still. But it's also to trust him. The fear of the Lord is is putting your trust in God, that, that you take him at his word, that he's not going to mislead you. He's not going to play jokes on you. When he exhorts you in his word to, to go and do, you, you don't second guess that. When he, when he exhorts in his word to stop, when he gives that, that uh, prohibition. The fear of the Lord. Proverbs 9, 10, look at that with me. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. That's why you can talk to somebody that has more degrees than a thermometer. But if their view of God is something that says, I don't, I don't need that. I, I don't need that crutch. Whatever. You're talking to an educated fool. You may learn something valuable from them, sort of like one writer said that, you know, a stopped clock is right twice a day. And even a blind hog finds an acre every now and then. And part of the problem that our, that our students have, our children have as they grow, move into higher education is they're going into places, universities, where one of the great presuppositions is that God and God's word and values has no place in this classroom. And I'm telling you, there's a whole uh, factory of educated foolishness. But we also know that wisdom leads to the knowledge of the, and fear of God. Look at Proverbs 2, 1 to 5. My son, if you receive my words and treasure up my commandments with you, look at this imagery here, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding. Yes, if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding. If you seek it like silver and search for it as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. We'll see if that's not happening. If there's not a receiving of the word of God, of the commandments, if there's, if there's not this attentive ear, this intentional, it's, it's Leaning and listening, leaning into is one of the one of the popular phrases today. Leaning into these things, inclining your heart, not just not just hearing, but inclining your heart, hearing with a view to doing. Remember James, be doers of the word and not hearers only. The people who only hear are deceiving themselves. Yes, if you call out for insight, in other words, not only do you recognize the value, but you but you request it. You, you beg for it. Teach me, Lord. And raise your voice. You're not, you're not shy or ashamed that you want it, that you recognize that you need it. The Scripture said, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who will, who will give you generously and will not upbraid or rebuke you. One of the problems that I see today is that people are afraid to admit that I don't know. I don't know. People to admit that they lack the wisdom for the matter, that they would just as soon make it up as they go, pretend. But if you you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you put value on it, if you seek it like silver, I mean, is is this document, one of the 66 books in the Scripture, does it have that value to us? If you search for it, if you, if you, rather than coming into the Proverbs and say, well, I don't understand. I'll, I'll, no, no, you, you dig in like hidden treasure. And you will understand the fear of the Lord. And you'll find the knowledge of God. 
It's almost as if he's saying here that you will, you will be given a set of lenses that help you develop a worldview that sees with discernment. Not infallibly. I still sometimes could kick myself for how, for how, how I missed this or missed that. But the value of this does cultivate a view of the world, a view of reality. Well, what about some keys to this? Well, of course, the key word, not going to surprise you, it's the word wisdom, as we've defined it. The key verses we read at the outset, uh, and the key chapter is chapter 31. This chapter, now think about when this was written. 900 something BC. You know the way Muslims treat women today? That's not a new thing. That's a carryover from days gone by. And this for this piece of writing to come onto the seen. Now look, we love the patriarchs and we learn much from them, but don't forget Abraham tried to pass his own wife off as his sister two occasions to save his skin. Women were not treated well. And yet you read Proverbs 31. It's one of the most noble views of women. It's, it, it sort of anticipates how Jesus comes on the scene in the first century we don't, we don't need a feminist movement. We need a Jesus movement. He escalated and elevated the view of women. And so we see in these verses that the, that the woman is a, she's a, she's a good woman. Uh, she's a good wife. She's a good mother. She's a good neighbor. She cares for them. She is valuable. When I read Proverbs 31, it talks about her, her, her value being worth more than rubies. I always remember uh, in 1 Peter 3 where, where uh, Peter's exhorting women. He talks about their, their godly deportment, conduct, which is of great value in the sight of God. You don't see many times in the Scripture where that, where that idea is connected. This attitude, this conduct, God values. But it shows up twice, once in the Old Testament, once in the New Testament, with reference to women. And of course, if you know the book of Proverbs, you know that her conduct and her, her concerns, her speech, her life, they stand in a stark contrast to the woman pictured in chapter 7, the seductress who wants to shipwreck a young man. And while it's not at all a one-way street, uh, historically we know that, that many a woman like that has taken down many men. It can be true conversely that many men like that have taken down many women. So this woman, this, this key chapter gives us a nobility and really a sense of advanced thinking way ahead of its time on the nobility of women in terms of how we as men ought to relate to them and how they themselves ought to conduct themselves. Well, what about, where do we find Jesus in Proverbs? You probably have an idea by now. In chapter 8, wisdom is personified. And seen in perfection. So let's look through some passages here, okay? I put a lot of this on the screen so you could track with me. Look at Proverbs 8, 22 to 31. The Lord possessed me at the beginning of his work, the first of his acts of old. Ages ago I was set up at the first, before the beginning of the earth. He's the, think about Jesus as the firstborn of all creation. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no springs abounding with water, 
Before the mountains had been shaped, before the hills I was brought forth, before he had made the earth with its fields or the first of the dust of the world. When he established the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep, when he made firm the skies above, when he established the fountains of the deep, when he assigned to the sea its limit so that the waters might not transgress his command, when he marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him like a master workman. I was daily his delight, rejoicing before him always, rejoicing in his inhabited world and delighting in the children of man. This is a picture of wisdom, but, but clearly it's a picture of, of the second person of the Trinity. Wisdom is personified, and his, his ultimate personification is manifested in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's also, uh, wisdom is also a source of, of biological and spiritual life. Look at these Look at Proverbs 3, 18. She is a tree of life to those who lay hold. This is that, that section of, of lady wisdom that was referenced on the video. She's a tree of life to those who lay hold of her. Those who hold her fast are called blessed. Blessed are all those who put their trust in him. In Proverbs 8, 35 and 36, for whoever finds me finds life and obtains favor from the Lord. But he who fails to find me injures himself. All who hate me love death. And so again, we're talking about, we're talking about wisdom. But in talking about wisdom, we're clearly talking about Jesus Christ. Wisdom also is righteous and moral. Look at Proverbs 8, 8 and 9. All the words of my mouth are righteous. There's nothing twisted or crooked in them. They are all straight to him who understands and right to those who find knowledge. And then wisdom is available to all who will receive it, Proverbs 8, 1 to 6. Does not wisdom call? Does not understanding raise her voice? On the heights beside the way, at the crossroads she takes her stand. Beside the gates in front of the town, at the entrance of the portal she cries aloud, to you, O men, I call, and my cry is to the children of man. O oh, simple ones, learn prudence. O oh, fools, learn sense. Hear, for I will speak noble things, and from my lips will come what is right. What a contrast from Proverbs chapter 7, the seductress who lures for purposes of destruction. Then again in Proverbs 8, verses 32 to 35, And now, O oh sons, listen to me. Blessed are those who keep my ways. Hear instruction and be wise. Do not neglect it. Blessed is the one who listens to me watching daily at my gates, waiting beside my doors. For whoever finds me finds life and obtains favor from the Lord. Now think about those Proverbs in the light of Colossians 2.3. Speaking of Jesus Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Or 1 Corinthians 1.30. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption. And then again in 1 Corinthians 1, we've just gone over this in recent months, verses 22 to 24. For Jews demand signs, Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, in other words, those who have been summoned so as to respond savingly to the gospel, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Proverbs is the book of wisdom, and you see Jesus Christ personified all the way through it. When you're exhorted to get wisdom, it's an exhortation. It's a gospel exhortation to get Jesus Christ. And you come to know him. And he promises when you come to know him, what? He will not leave us as orphans. He will give us the helper, the Holy Spirit, who will lead us into all truth. After Jesus' resurrection and ascension, you go read in the book of Acts, and you see how the Holy Spirit opens their eyes to understand what he was talking about earlier. Applied, living, skillfully, how to live. 
So this is one of those books that, uh, without calling, identifying this with God, clearly is speaking of the one we know as the Savior of sinners. Well, what about its contribution to the Bible? Uh, well, it forms this uh, corpus of, of material with Job and Ecclesiastes. This is the, the wisdom literature of the Bible. Uh, it's, it's kind of built upon, as we've already talked about, this idea of the fear of Yahweh, the covenant God. This is the basis for practical holiness and, and, and living well, living godly in an ungodly age. This book, is, and I think the author of the video said this, speaks to everyone in every age. You can't read through a verse in this book and say, well, that's passe. No. You can look at some of the sacrifices uh, in the Old Testament and say, well, we don't do that anymore, but it's, it's a foreshadowing of Jesus. But this living is just as practical and important and meaningful today as it was the day it was penned. And they're true to life. One writer said this. I thought he said, Psalms emphasizes a walk before God and the devotional life. Proverbs concentrates on a walk before men in daily life. Another writer said this. You should read the Proverbs very slowly in small sections. And then I came across this. I didn't put these slides on there, but I came across one fellow talked about the humor, some of the humor in the Proverbs. I'll just read a few of them to you. Proverbs eleven twenty two, Like a gold ring in a pig's snout is a beautiful woman without discretion. Judy Rogers is a uh, uh, children's songwriter. She has several CDs, songs for children. And one of them she sings, I think it's, it may have been her CD on Proverbs, is a song entitled, Isabel is a Pig. You familiar with this? Isabel is a pig with a ring in her snout. You can dress Izzy up, but you can't take her out because she'll jump in the middle of a big mud puddle because Isabel is a pig. And it goes through and it talks about how, how, how pretty little girls with their buttons and bows, how they, how they need to be, they need to have some some discretion in, in how they live and how they think. Otherwise, you've just put a gold ring in a pig's snout. And you've seen this, by the way. You've seen young women. They don't have a ring in their snout, but they might as well. So I thought it's interesting. Proverbs 19, 24. The sluggard buries his hand in the dish and will not even bring it back to his mouth. I mean, think about the image there. Just how, how lazy is that? that you put your hand in the dish to feed yourself and you're so lazy, you won't even bring it back to your mouth. What a powerful picture of a slugger. One of my deacons at, a, at the church in Clinton used to say of lazy people, he said, you couldn't pour a job on that fellow. It's a pretty, pretty powerful picture. And then of course, Proverbs 23, 13, do not withhold discipline from a child. If you strike him with a rod, he will not die. You'll be arrested for that today. And here's how, here's how a, a proverb about how some people cling to strong drink. They struck me, you will say, but I was not hurt. They beat me, but I did not feel it. When shall I awake? I must have another drink. No matter what the provocations are, what the, what the pressures are, the answer is I must have another drink. And you know this one, Proverbs 24, 33, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. And then this one, this one is intriguing. Proverbs 25, 24, it's better to live in a corner of the housetop, you know where I'm going with this, than in a house shared with a quarrelsome wife. Then I like this one about the sluggard here. Proverbs 26, 13 to 16. The sluggard says, there's a lion in the road. There's a lion in the streets. As a door turns on its hinges, so does a sluggard on his bed. And here's the sluggard buries his hand in the dish 
It wears him out to bring it back to his mouth. The sluggard is wiser in his own eyes than seven men who can answer sensibly. You, if you know people like you, you know exactly what he's talking about there. Proverbs 27, 15, and 16. A continual dripping on a rainy day and a quarrelsome wife are alike. To restrain her is to restrain the wind or to grasp oil in one's right hand. Proverbs 30, 15. The leech has two daughters. Give and give. Three things are never satisfied. Four never say enough. So anyway, this, just to encourage you to take a look at that. And then one last thing I want to share is someone has pointed out some comparisons between the book of Proverbs and the book of James. I don't know if you've ever thought about this before. Uh, James, of course, speaks uh, about the tongue. And uh, when he says in chapter 1, verse 26, if anyone thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue, but but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. You think about the Proverbs. It says things like, there's one whose rash words are like sword thrusts, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Truthful lips endure forever, but a lying tongue is but for a moment. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. The tongue of the wise commends knowledge, but the mouth of fools pour folly. And the same thing could be said, by the way, on on some of the things James says about wisdom, that the wisdom that's from above, contrasting with the wisdom that's from, from beneath, and that there are passages in Proverbs that just seem to line up and shadow that. So, so you could say that, that, that portions of James are like the New Testament version of Proverbs. And you could also say that, the, that this New Testament expression, this, this clearly gospel expression, finds its friend in the book of Proverbs, that Proverbs is a, a very evangelical book. It talks about gospel living, gospel